In the year 1982, as the world witnessed the debut of the first commercial CD player and marveled at the launch of the Space Shuttle Columbia, a different kind of innovation was taking shape, far from the public eye. In a modest office, overshadowed by the glamour of Wall Street skyscrapers, Jim Simons was quietly setting the stage for a new revolution. A former mathematician and Cold War codebreaker was poised to challenge the most renowned investors of his time names like Warren Buffett and George Soros. Unlike the famed investors of his era who relied on instinct and traditional stock analysis methods, Simons placed his faith in the idea that the market's chaos could be untangled with algorithms and data. He envisioned using the precise language of mathematics, heralding the era of quantitative analytics-based trading, a strategy that dominates the investment world today. Renaissance Technologies and its flagship medallion fund became legends in finance, delivering an average annual return of over 66%, earning its founder billions, and a recognition as the greatest investor of all time by The Economist. In this journey, we will explore how Simons traversed from the quietude of a classroom to the pinnacle of Wall Street, revolutionizing the financial world with every step. Jim Simon's story starts in 1938 in a typical Jewish household. But from a young age, it was clear there was nothing typical about Jim. Before he even started school, he was solving mathematical problems that would stump many adults. At 17, he took this talent to MIT, one of the most prestigious science and technology universities in the world, where he didn't just fit in, he excelled, completing his degree in just three years. But Jim didn't stop there. He faced the challenge of graduate courses head-on and pushed through to earn his PhD from the University of California by the young age of 23. Then, his brilliant mind caught the attention of Harvard University, where he began to teach and share his love for mathematics. But very soon, in 1964, Jim's career took a sharp turn. He left the academic world for a secretive role at the Institute for Defense Analyses in Princeton. Here, he was part of a team working on breaking codes during the Cold War, a job that mixed his love for puzzles with high stakes. This work provided Jim with a first real exposure to computers and algorithms, tools he would later use to crack an entirely different code, the stock market. However, by 1968, Simons hit a snag. He was fired from the IDA for speaking out against the Vietnam War, an unpopular move with the bosses. So, he shifted gears and became the head of the math department at Stony Brook University in New York. Here, he dug into the complex world of shapes and sizes in math, working alongside big names like Jeff Cheeger. Unlike his academic colleagues, Simons was attracted to money and wanted to be rich. During this time in New York, he had his first taste of the stock market. A modest gift of $5,000 became his first stake in this new venture. With investments in stocks and, intriguingly, soybean futures, which unexpectedly doubled his money. This experience sparked his curiosity about trading. By the late 70s, Simons was ready for a change. Back then, traders still relied on reading newspapers, gathering company information, trying to find insiders, and just trusting their gut feelings. At first, Simons followed this approach too, but he got frustrated by the randomness of stock movements and became obsessed with finding a pattern, a deep structure, a way to predict the next move accurately. By 1977, Jim's speculative interest took a more serious turn when a venture into trading sugar futures, guided by a quantitative analytics model developed by his friend Charles Freifeld, yielded tenfold return. Though this success may have been attributed to luck, as prices soon dropped in contradiction to the model's predictions, Jim was convinced of the potential in applying mathematical models to trading. With currency markets starting to float freely, he saw an opportune moment to explore this new domain further. Now is when Jim Simons shakes up the investment world. When he left academia in the summer of 1978 to start trading, he was full of confidence in his experience and skills as a respected mathematician. Using his background on vast datasets, 
Simon set out to build computer models that he believed could identify patterns in the market to profit from. Later that year, the mathematician launched his new investment company, calling it Monometrics. He combined the words money and econometrics, indicating that he would use mathematics to analyze financial data and gain trading profits. Simons would handpick a team of bright minds to analyze market data. The new company raised $4 million from external investors, and the stage was set for a new chapter in currency trading. The decision to focus on currency markets was strategic. In the late 1970s and early 1980s, the world witnessed significant shifts in economic policies, leading to increased volatility in currency values. This volatility presented a ripe environment for Simon's data-driven strategies. According to Gregory Zuckerman, a reporter for the Wall Street Journal, their first algorithms were focused on data that leverages even the smallest and shortest price fluctuations with an average holding period of two days. But even though Simon's thought he had a winning formula, he wasn't sure how to develop his initial success further. However, he had someone specific in mind, his ex-colleague from the IDA, Leonard Baum, a top-notch mathematician and cryptanalyst who had experience predicting short-term outcomes in chaotic situations. Simons asked Baum to spend a day at his monometrics office in Long Island to help set up a trading system for currency speculation. Baum chuckled at the idea. He wasn't familiar with trading and wasn't much into investing either. In fact, he had left all the family's investment decisions to his wife. Still, as a favor, Baum agreed to collaborate for a while. In 1979, Baum started working with Simons once a week. But just half a year later, Baum got so attached to working in monometrics that didn't even hesitate to put his academic career aside to pursue trading further. In the early 1980s, long before Bloomberg terminals became commonplace on Wall Street trading desks, Monometrics invested in many expensive computers, high-speed connections, and massive data storage. At that time, this technology wasn't commercially available, but what it provided was crucial, a database of clean and live market prices that literally nobody else had in the investment world. Three years later, in 1983, from a shopping center in Long Island, the professor and codebreaker was already so confident he could reinvent financial speculation, he changed the name from Monometrics to Renaissance Technologies. Instead of hiring the usual analysts and economists to expand his company, he hired more mathematicians, physicists, and computer scientists. And the craziest part? None of them had any experience on Wall Street. Now, the question is, how did Renaissance Technologies operate? The easy answer is that the company studies the past because it's reasonably certain that investors will make similar decisions in the future. At the same time, analysts adopt the scientific method to combat cognitive and emotional biases, trying to let data guide them instead of relying on intuition as was common at that time. With his method, he showed that with enough data, computing power, and modeling experience, it's possible to determine many of the hidden factors that drive stock prices, things that would be completely invisible to other investors. Looking at it another way, the goal is pretty simple. Create powerful algorithms that can predict market ups and downs and build investment models that work on their own with minimal human oversight. He wanted to live the dream of a trading bot that made money while he slept. But to do that, they needed data. Simons dug into historical records from the World Bank and the Federal Reserve, going all the way back to the 18th century. That's how they started using the quantitative analysis he always dreamed of. The mathematician and his partner's big secret was focusing on eliminating one thing in all their operations, emotions. And that was a big advantage. They paid attention to the importance of big data long before Facebook took over. Over time, after refining their algorithms to the fullest, Renaissance proved their founder's hypothesis. The hidden structure was indeed there, and it became a real money-making machine. Their approach was about to change modern finance. Nowadays, quantitative investors are the majority, controlling over 30% of stock trades worldwide, though nobody does it as effectively as Renaissance. According to the New York Post, 
the hedge fund manages $130 billion in its impressive investment portfolio. Yet, they'd work just as hard to keep their formula secret. This is probably the most profitable fund ever. It's estimated to have earned over $100 billion for its owners from 1988 to 2018. Using quantified trading strategies, the Medallion Fund achieved an average gross return of 66.1% before fees during that period. Since it's such a profitable fund, it charges huge fees to unit owners. Net returns are only 39%. This is a remarkable track record, much better than Warren Buffett's, although his growth has been exponential over a longer period. Now, can we decipher their operational process? Well, at least we can try. It's known that when they started, they first looked for patterns in market data that seemed like anomalies, situations that didn't seem to have an explanation. These patterns had to be statistically significant. They couldn't be mere coincidences. They also had to involve many trades and signals in the market. They also hid their future trades. If they saw an anomaly at 11 a.m., they didn't buy exactly at that time to avoid disturbing the market. Lastly, they could leverage their huge diversification. It is, in fact, was what allowed them to achieve such high returns. After proving himself right and being seen as a genius, Simons retired in 2010 at the age of 72 with an estimated net worth of over $29 billion. Though he still holds the non-executive presidency of the investment fund he created, he's now focused on philanthropy. A decade ago, he and his wife, Dr. Marilyn Horace Simons, joined the Giving Pledge, a philanthropic effort led by Warren Buffett and Bill Gates, where American billionaires pledged to donate most of their wealth. Through the Simons Foundation, the couple funds research projects related to autism, organizations like Math for America, which supports math teachers in public schools, and the Flatiron Institute, a research center dedicated to fields like quantum physics and astrophysics. Meanwhile, his formula continues to make money, just as he intended. But it is worth noting that despite Simon's incredible success, even surpassing well-known investors like Buffett and Soros, he isn't as widely recognized outside of financial circles. Perhaps partly because he has kept his investment formula so secret, or because he prefers a low profile dedicated to mathematics and philanthropy instead of seeking public fame. Although, if you think about it, Perhaps fame isn't such a cherished asset for this mathematician. Otherwise, he would have surely made an algorithm for it. Nevertheless, for those familiar with his incredible story, there is no doubt that Simons deserves to be considered the greatest investor of all time.